I distinctly remember this conversation we had really towards the end where you said, I think I want to end the friendship, but I want to continue the business. And I said to you, you wanted the opposite. I don't want to do business, do business you with you, friends. but I want to be friends. I know mm. we literally were, that's how much we were like not on the same page. And that's where I also felt like, oh, this is weird. Shannon has like direct audio, but the friend doesn't. So their, their audios are a little off, just a heads up. Like, yeah, like that's, we really lost our friendship. Hi there lovers and friends. This is a very special video to me. In short, it's about two ex-best friends and ex-business partners who haven't talked at all for the past five mm -hmm. years. Not a tweet, not a like, sitting across from each other in two round green chairs. One of the reasons I don't watch Shannon's content, and it's no disrespect to her obviously, is Shan has very personal conversations and just as a content consumer, that's not the content I watch normally. Um, I'm okay with, it just feels a little bit too, it feels a little bit like vulnerability for views. And I say that with absolutely no judgment because I get it. But when content feels like vulnerability for views, it makes me feel icky, just like a personal feeling. But I do appreciate that Shan's made such a name for herself and she's really upheld her brand. But even like already, the tension is so real that I'm like, girl, but let's see how they handle it. Let's see how they handle it. And really talking for the first time in five years, when I had my partnership opportunity with Squarespace, we were talking about how much it really is about rebuilding, rebranding, rejuvenating. And the videos that I created around my Squarespace partnership, I wanted to really reflect that same theme. So when I was brainstorming ideas, reaching out to Andrea seemed like the perfect fit because I think our relationship was really in need of a re. So before- It's just weird to have these conversations for the camera and not in private. You know, like, isn't it kind of strange? Yes, thank you, Beza says the values of her loyalty top is slaying. This was a total coincidence. I literally didn't mean to wear this shirt while talking about ex-best friends, but literally like values over loyalty. I don't know why they broke up. Some people just go their own way. Sometimes it's the difference of religion. Who knows? Friendships break up for all kinds of reasons, right? It's not a bad thing that friendships end. It's not a bad thing that relationships end. It is simply two people going their own way, which I think is like really important. But values over loyalty merch, get it in the uh, links in the description. Thank you for supporting the content. Before we get into that conversation in depth, I want to talk a bit more about Squarespace. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Woo -woo. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, we love a make it fast and make it look stunning with Squarespace. Good for her, girl. Get that bag. So I met Shannon when I was nine or ten, oh, around that age. Oh, that's young. Does anyone know who she, how old Shannon is? I forget. I know she's in her 30s, right? She's got to be. Because, like, I will tell you this, my oldest best friend, we also met when we were, like, 9, 10. I was 9, she was 10. And we've known each other all these years, and we're like, still very, 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 very close. Like, regardless of differences, we've really managed to, like, uphold this friendship. And, you know, it's a really sacred friendship. So, like, I'm always shocked when people have known each other for so long, and it, they don't stay friends as adults. But also, that's so normal. I knew tons of people as a child that I don't know as an adult, right? It makes sense. But okay, let's see how this ends up. Um, at this thing called Girl Guides, which is like the equivalent to Girl Scouts in the US. Um, that's mm -hmm. where we met. But I don't, I can't remember us like really knowing each other at that time, but I, I remember like knowing, seeing her and her sister. And then we really got to know each other again um, in high school. Oh, and when we first started out in high school, um, there was like a group of 40 of us that we referred to as the bad gals. Nonetheless, like a few years later, when people started to change schools, life happened, and then it was really just me and Andrea, and that's when we formed Those Girls Are Wild. We really were wild, but we made wild into our own thing. Like for us, it was like a girl who was comfortable being herself. She was career motivated, but she was still young and she was still fun and she was still figuring herself mm -hmm. out at the exact same time. She didn't take herself too seriously. Wait, y'all are saying you remember her from Degrassi. I don't, re it's been so many years since I've watched Degrassi, like the original series. I didn't realize it, but now that you're saying it, my brain is processing her as maybe somebody I know, but I can't tell, but that's so interesting. Okay, she's a Degrassi girl. And that was what the, the like the, 
the epitome of being a wild girl was. And uh, and I think that was what was fun about Those Girls Are Wild is that other people thought it was funny, but I think in reality, Shan and I were just more focused on making each other laugh. Those Girls Are Wild in its heyday was just like a complete 360 reflection of everything I loved at the time, mm -hmm. including Andrea and my friendship with her, which really was like the center and the heart of the blog. Well, it was it was fun. I love Those Girls Are Wild. I still do. Oh, here we go. Hold on, we had a major fallout. The screen says we had a major fallout in 2012. A couple of months ago, we spoke for the first time since then. Today, we revisited that convo on camera. Ooh, girl, I'm nervous for you. Okay, why did we, what happened with the fallout? Hmm, okay, so when I, I mean on my end, mind you. When I think about it, um, I remember having a few like moments with between each other where I just was unhappy and I don't think either of us had ever like properly expressed our discomfort or unhappiness. I think we just kind of like balled these things in. Um, and then truly what made me be like, oh, was our second pilot. So we had done two pilots, which to me, when I look back on it, is kind of like really showing a mix of things. How like different our career goals had gotten, but mm. also how much we were still like. Shan is very career oriented. She's very specific with branding. Her and Jared, her partner, they're very specific with branding. It's again, I don't watch her, so I only check in on occasion. But one thing that stands out to me is that she is very intentional with her branding. And I don't know anything about this era of Shan and shoot, what's her name? What's the best friend's name, guys? So I, I don't know anything about this particular era, so I, I'm kind of coming in blind. Like trying our best to mold them together, but that was the thing. I think our friendship had become so wrapped up in Those Girls Are Wild that it was hard for us to just express to each other as friends what, that like to, to remove that pressure. And so I remember after doing the second pilot or the third part of, you know, third filming, um, I just felt so unhappy, like really, really, really like, oh, I'm not, I did not enjoy any of that. And especially- Okay, Chet is saying her name is Andrea. Yes, Andrea Lewis, is that correct? Okay, Andrea, Andrea. Especially for me, like growing up as an actress, being an actress, mm. those like being on set is like my comfort zone. That's like my genuine, like, ooh, I feel my happiest in any on set scenario. And, um, I remember feeling really like, oh, did not enjoy any of that. My boyfriend at the time, he was like, what kind of was my like confirmation? Cause he was like, I didn't like that. Like I didn't, did not like any of it. And I was like, me either. And I don't want to do that ever again. And mm. in those days, I really didn't know like how to, uh, be, like just speak about something, it was very cut and dry. It was like, if that's something I don't like, I'm never doing it again, and that's just that. Like, cause we never had those discussions. We just never, we never had conflict. And there's always a gift and a curse to that. Like, yeah. I've even been in relationships like that where we like never argue, and at some point you're like, we never argue. And then it's like, mm, but it's coming. And <laughs> when we do, we'll probably never talk to each other ever again, cause it's just too big. And at that time, um, yeah, I felt, I think, just genuinely lost as to what to do. And I think in reality, I probably needed more of like a break, but it just was a very like, this is it, Shannon, and I don't want to do this ever again. I'm mm -hmm. super unclear mostly about that time. Like, I know, I remember one definitive conversation that we had where I think for me, the frustration, I guess, was not finding a way for us to equally distribute the work. And I remember they're just not being on my end enough empathy for the relationship that you had that was a serious adult relationship. Mm -hmm. But around that time, I know we had started selling the hats mm -hmm. and I felt like that was put all on me to do. And be and my perspective of it was that you just took it all. Right. In reality, like that's how it felt. It felt like Shannon was just like, I'll do all of this. 
But you had moved to New York like as almost as soon as the hats came. Uh, yeah. I think that was also part of it too of like the mistake that I made that I didn't clock of I wanted a friendship that wasn't based on the business, but I based our friendship on the business. So mm. your relationship was inconvenient because I'm like, we have these hats to ship, you're with this guy, you're not helping me, we have this pilot, you're not helping me, and I'm like, but she's in a relationship with someone that's new, who's di who lives in a different country altogether. There's a different set of work and time that that's gonna take to foster mm. and to grow. And instead of like being happy for that, I like channeled it through the business and how it wasn't functional for the business rather than being happy for my friend. Mm -hmm. So I was like part of the problem that I didn't want in the first place. You know, it's weird, I guess, when I can look back at even my own relationship at the time, is I used to look at him like as if, I used, I used to look at you as like this person that I had who was like a lot of things for me and then like he re replaced you. Like, so that's why I also, sadly, it was also easier to be like, I don't need to be friends with Shannon anymore because she's stressing me out and I can just move on here to this person um. because he literally became like all the things, especially like tech, tech wise and like all these little things, he literally became this person. I actually, in my mind, used to literally think of it, which is so weird because it's like, you were you were my friend. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like literally talking about this person, like they became now my like safe blanket. And so Mm, 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 mm. You know, friendship dynamics, every dynamic changes everything, but nothing changes your life like work. Like nothing changes your life like work. You know, I think people don't understand that the more successful you become, the less time you have for people. It's not the reverse. Everyone always makes this leap that, oh, if I made more money, I'd have more time for family. Mm. It's like being poor. If you're working every day, three times, like three jobs at the same time, like you also don't have time for family. And there's a conversation that needs to be had in everyone's life. Am I going to prioritize work or family? And that's why we talk about work-life balance. But this is also is about the intimacy we get from our communities. When you're single, your where you get your intimacy is different. When you're partnered, your intimacy is different. But then how your career changes is also different. You know, everything is different. When you're a college student and your besties to when you're an adult and your besties, from dating in high school to dating as a college student to dating in your 40s, like everything we do will change the dynamic. Sickness changes a dynamic. Uh, a diagnosis can change a dynamic. Like everything can change how things happen. That's why you have to negotiate. It's why you have to update people. It's why you also have to be kind of transparent. Like, hey, talking to you stresses me out right now. I need some space. And that needs to be okay, like to some extent. Of course, that's why I personally try to figure out and negotiate with people. Like, what do you expect of me? Because again, friendships are things that I think, one, people take for granted. And two, they do not negotiate. And that's why you'll have people say like, oh my gosh, like I thought we were closer than we were. Or I thought you knew me better than this. Or I thought because we were friends, X, Y, Z. All of that stuff needs to be talked about. Humans are too messy to assume, and yet we do it all the time. So it's interesting that she's willing to recognize that she was getting that intimacy from somebody else. But also, this is why I think you should have lines between whether or not your partner comes to work with you. Like, I'm I'm really glad that I go to work and my partner doesn't come to work with me. He sometimes does help me with tech stuff, for sure. But he's not, like, in my business. He doesn't, on the day-to-day, -day, is not involved he lets me do my own thing. I don't want him to feel like my business is reliant on him when I'm the one who chose this career versus some couples like Shannon and Jared who are married and have kids. They do a lot of their business together, not fully because I know he has his own career, I think, in music, right, guys? And he's a model maybe. I can't remember. And Shan has her own thing, but they also have some crossover. That can be very tense. It can be tense to go to work with your partner every day. It can be tense to go to work with your best friend every day. And look, when I was younger, I think we all had this where like, oh my God, if you could just go into business with your best friends, how cool would that be? Not very good because the personal overlaps and it gets really awkward and things get really strange. And I've learned that lesson so many times where you think it's cool that your friends go to work with you and then you realize like, oh, this is inappropriate. Because like personal stuff leaks out, it gets weird, there's not, it's just uncomfortable. So you got to be like, oop, separate personal from work, please. Like, let's do that. But how do you do that if you go into business directly with a friend? How do you do that? 
That's really difficult to know. So, you know, I can see how this probably got really tense for both of them. So, yeah, and I needed like, uh, I like needed him. I needed, I think I needed almost the same thing in the sense of like, I needed uh, change mm. very much. Like, I didn't feel like a lot was working out for me. And so when he came, he became like just this like really good savior for me and so I I literally like clung to the whole hope of it I used to truly believe like that I was like okay maybe God just wants me to put all my eggs in this basket like, I also think the kind of the byproduct of a slow breakup is the people who are on either side like my friends and my family closest to me who were around for like when things started to get really weird they're only hearing the weird stories yeah, nobody hears anything and so they're starting to like feed into the negativity for you or you lose trust for that person and everybody around you also is reinforcing they're not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And so you stop looking at simple things as being face value. Mm -hmm. You like look for some kind of hitting meeting in things where the person genuinely didn't mean anything like that. And mm -hmm. I think that's like one of the things when I spoke to you the first time, like, you know, a few months ago for, mm -hmm. after five years was like how much of things that I did with no shit underneath it felt like there was a bunch of shit underneath it to you For this sure. this is what i this is maybe possibly why i'm an optimist in a way but also i just think that people are on a journey look when i say values over loyalty like on my merch right now it says values over loyalty i'm trying to say i can love you unconditionally and i can be friends with you not unconditionally necessarily because it depends on who we're talking about but it's but I need to be able to say my piece because that allows us to both be agents, like free agents. The dilemma in friendships and relationships and communities is there's an expectation for you to numb or quiet parts of yourself to make the peace, which is why I think it's important to know if you're a community member or more of a no matter an individual, because look, we're all individuals in a community, but not everybody has a community meeting once a week. They do like, some people do local church events. Some people do school events. Some people do work events. Some people are more extroverted and social and some people aren't. And so you have to play to your strength in that regard because once people do sort of rely on you in that way, the moment you want to do something different, it can feel like abandonment, right? And this is something I think everyone struggles with at some point in their life. I hear it a lot from people that are like single and then their friends get married and have babies and they're like, oh my gosh, my friends had a baby and they changed. It's like, well, life changed. It's not that they changed, even though of course they changed. It's just that it's like, of course their baby has to come first. I don't even know why you're upset about this. I understand what they're saying, but also if when you were single and without children, you partied every weekend, I hope to God your friend who had a baby changed and started prioritizing their family. It's like we're sad that our friends grow or something. And I just don't understand that. It's about being happy for people's happy. But also it can be difficult when it feels like, why can't we be happy? Why can't we make this friendship work? It sometimes just doesn't work out. But also it doesn't mean those people are bad people. It doesn't mean it's not painful. You know, I've had so many friends who would say, oh, I hate ghosting. Ghosting is the worst thing ever. And then they would ghost and it'd be like, oh, the person I expected not to ghost me ghosted me. And that's so strange because here you are relying on them to walk the walk to say like, I will never ghost you. And then they ghost you and you're like, what the? And you realize like, it's not about you. It's about their journey and their life. And that's what they're doing. Chet says, I really miss my high school best friend. I was so in my own head that I left her hanging and ghosted. I wish I could talk to her again, but I respect her space. I hope she's joyful. Hey, and that's the part of high school that's so hard. I mean, gosh, I ghosted somebody in high school. And that's when I learned I don't like ghosting. It's a very painful process. It's hurtful to people. But also I know that when people do it, they're also doing it to like preserve something. And I think that's really important. So even now I recognize that the people who have ghosted me, it's not even about me. It is about something they needed to do for themselves. And how can you fault them? You know, but I think that's why you have to get secure in yourself. It allows your friends to go on that journey and to end friendships without it needing to be the end all be all of your whole universe, which again goes back to that conversation we had earlier in the week. Just because things end, I think we had it on the discord, just because things end doesn't mean your life ends. People get to do their own journey separate from you or with you, but they get to do their own journey. You gotta let people do their journey, you know? And I think that's a really 
a place in a relationship again where you brought up a great point of like needing to go to therapy because you have to like get back to that space of knowing that like when this person offers you a drink, it's not because they're like, let's just see if they're <laughs> gonna make a face when they drink my drink or like let there's yeah. no, there's nothing behind it other than like, oh you look thirsty. Yeah, yeah. It was that intense. And it was like we loved each other also that much. Like we just it was very intense. It was mm. not like a little easy peasy. Interesting. Chat says sometimes it's it is about you though. No, I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. Because even if that person is saying like, okay, you've got two people and one person is stabbing the other person and they're like, hey, I can't hang out with you anymore. That's still not even about the person stabbing you. It's about you needing to save your life because somebody is stabbing you. Right? I think sometimes we say like, oh, it's you. You're the reason. If you wouldn't stab me, I would stay. But it's always about you because you're the person who doesn't want to be stabbed. So it kind of like is about what you're doing. I think it's right to say to some extent, like, I don't, first of all, I don't believe in blame and I don't believe in pointing fingers. I believe in saying, because this happened, I need to act this way. But that means the I that is acting is about me, right? So I think this is about my personal beliefs about people. I think people are like tornadoes and we're all just doing our natural thing and we're meeting at a space in time. So I don't blame the tornado for being a tornado. So I don't blame people for doing bad actions. I just say, okay, if you're going to do this way, this thing, I'm going to do this thing. I don't, I don't need you to change. I don't need you to act differently, but I need to react accordingly. So it's about recognizing like people are within their nature and their nature is like their journey and it is what it is. But it doesn't mean, again, you don't have to abandon the tornado. You don't have to want the tornado to change. You don't have to blame the tornado. You can just move out of its way or move to a different state where there are no tornadoes, <laughs> you know? So again, I don't, I don't personally like to blame people. I prefer just to acknowledge that like, okay, if you're going to do this, then I'm going to have to do this. But also, I would never ask you to change. I just need to do what I'm going to do. Be like, good night kind of thing. So, it, yeah, it was the easily the biggest breakup that I've experienced and truly that I have experienced. I, I use it as, for all kinds of examples all the time. Mm. <laughs> of like, well, I learned this lesson a long time ago when I had this breakup. Like, mm. I, it's, it really was like the beginning of a lot for me, so. I think the biggest lesson that I learned was you don't actually know why. I think a lot of the times with you, I wasn't asking genuine questions. So if I felt like I was overwhelmed with work, I wasn't like, what's going on with you and your world? You know, how, how are you managing and balance on your own end? I think I was just making a bunch of assumptions that just weren't based in reality. Mm. And this is very big of Shan to admit because I do think this is so natural and so human to just assume, assume, assume. And that's why I say like, just check your brain, make sure it's not malfunctioning, go to therapy, make sure you're not projecting onto other people or misunderstanding a situation. Make sure you're not like your little child isn't coming out and feeling abandoned. Like make sure that when you are judging people, you're kind of having a, a conversation about why you feel that way about that person. And so sometimes you have to acknowledge like, I might be distorting or I might be misunderstanding or I might just be uh, miscategorizing. Like, it's not a bad thing to get things wrong, right? But if you walk around thinking everyone's out to get you, that's a level of paranoia that like you can get help for. There's no reason to live your life paranoid about people. People are not that scary. But it is okay to also live a life that's cautious and thoughtful without being paranoid. It really wasn't until... We stopped being friends. You started making videos in your own channel. I started to learn more about what you were going through mentally at that time. Mm -hmm. And even health wise, I didn't know the health challenges that you were going through, I think until very, very later in the game. Mm -hmm. And so that made me question mm -hmm. what kind of friend I was really making myself available to be if I was best friends with somebody who didn't feel comfortable saying, this is where I'm hurting and how I'm hurting. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I. Because I didn't know those things and I didn't ask in the right way, I was making assumptions on your character um, mm. that just were completely not based on the truth. So I would probably say the biggest lesson that I learned is if you love somebody, then love them enough to give them blank pages, to give them space to be not what you expect mm -hmm. and for you not to have all the answers. Even if you've known someone for, because mm -hmm. I've known you since I was like a kid, like 20 years I've probably known you in total. Yeah, yeah. So, 
I've known you for so long, so I think I just stopped giving you blank pages mm -hmm. of like, oh, there's stuff about her I don't know. Yes. There's things that she's going through that I have. Yes, oh, this is so powerful. I, I actually am not connected to. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until years later when I started to look back, it was like things started to make sense because I started to get to know you in a way that I just, at the time, I just didn't make myself available to. Um, oh, this is so powerful. And I think it stems from adolescence. I'm gonna talk about, about, about a very specific girl bubble, a very specific bubble about friendship, right? So very, very, very specific bubble where you are told as a child that your best friend knows everything about you. And that's just not true because you don't even know everything about you. <laughs> You don't even know everything about you yet. You should learn new things about yourself on the daily. And that means when you're not talking to your friends and that gap occurs, between that gap, you are still growing as a person. Remember that when I turn off stream, I'm still become I'm still changing as a person and learning as a person. Remember that when we stop talking to our friend on the phone, okay, love you, bye, ching, and 30 days goes by, and those 30 days that person is learning and growing new things about, like learning new things about themselves that they haven't told you about. So like when I catch up with my friends, I go, hey, what's new? What's going on? What's new, right? I'm asking for an update, an update that they can choose how to inform me on. You don't have to tell me every detail. I am not entitled to your privacy or your inner thoughts, especially now that we're in our 30s, 40s, whatever we're in. I'm not entitled to my friend's personal inner thoughts. But as a teenager, we were told that if you're really best friends with your friend, they'll tell you everything. But now that we're adults, it's inappropriate. Like it's inappropriate, right? Like you have to have boundaries, especially as you age and especially with other people's information and especially with your inner thoughts. Like your best friends are not your therapists, right? Like you can't be burdening your best friends with your traumas. Like you need to go to a professional, right? And at the same time, it's okay for your friend to be there when you really need a support system from a family member. Look, support system from family is different than support system from a medical professional. And you've got to know the difference, right? And this takes a conversation. I know a lot of people who feel very entitled to people's time when they're having a baby, when they're going through treatment, when they're in therapy, when they're having a change, when they're moving. Ooh, moving is a new update too. I got to an age in my life where I stopped asking my friends to help me how to move, like to move. And like, you just do it yourself or you hire a company. There is an age in your life where you can't just buy pizzas and Coke for your friends or Pepsi or beer and expect them to come help you move. People have careers. People have a life. You can't just ask them to drop everything and come help you move. Okay, we're not in our 20s anymore. But I think there is a time in which that is appropriate. Hey, bro, come over, help me move. I'll pay you in pizza and beer. Yes, absolutely. But not in your 30s, 40s, and 50s, 60s. Come on. Like, you can do that if you want. I just don't want to negotiate for that friendship. I want friends that use money as a way to make things happen for themselves. Because like, girl, we're all too busy, okay? We can barely brush our teeth and wash our like bedding. You want me to come do your chores for you? Girl, we already have our own dishes to worry about. Thank you so much. Like, no, you know? And at the same time, if my friend called me and said, hey, I'm going through a really rough time right now. Can you come help me do my dishes? And it was a super rare and very important situation, yes. But if you're calling me every weekend to come do your dishes, now you have a problem and you need to go to a medical professional, right? You need to go to somebody who's helping you because it is not normal for you to need your friend to come help you with your dishes every week. Of course, we want to be there for friends and family in really unique and hard situations. Absolutely, girl. That's why I say be very careful because the right people will make an appropriate request of you. And sometimes people make inappropriate requests of you. It'd be quite inappropriate, okay? If somebody called me and said, hey, can you fly from Europe to the United States to help me like do something that honestly, frankly, like you can't ask me to do this. Like this is too much. There is just a line and the line is negotiated. I can't even tell you what it would be because the line is specific to you. But this is so important. We have to remember that our friends, our family, our moms, our dads, our people in our life, they have a whole life outside of us. And we have to give them space to tell, like to allow them to tell us who, who they are. Don't be that boomer who's like, I know you better than you know yourself. Ugh. 
What a gross, gross thing to say about people when you're not even giving them a chance to tell you who they are. Uh, Discord says, I just asked my best friend if she has time and energy for whatever specific conversation I want to have. And she started doing the same and I love it. Oh, I love it. That's the way you to do it. That's the way to do it, Discord. But then also I'll say this because it's like, I openly talk about depression all the time, but I don't always express it to people. And I like have had a very, like very recent moment earlier in the year where it was like, one of my friends was being directly affected by my depression and in the past, she actually never had to see it, like not for real. So she was making a lot of assumptions and I just got really mad and I was like, in reality, you don't realize this, but we've been friends for so long and it's like, it's it, you don't get to see me when I don't wanna talk to people. So you, I communicate with you kind of always, so you never get to see me on my darkest and my saddest. And so this is why it's easy for you to make all these assumptions, but I said, it, it made me realize you don't know anything about mental health and you don't much, have much patience on it because it's quick to be like, something's wrong with you, you're not talking to me. It's easy for people, I find, to, um, I, you're mad at me. I'm going to be mad at you. Right. <laughs> That's <laughs> immature. That's not good. I'm mad at you. I'm going to be mad at No, 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 no. Listen, you don't have to be mad at people just because they're mad at you. Like I said, it really transforms your life when you don't hold grudges. Let me tell you, I am mad at nobody. Everyone is on a journey. And you can be upset in the moment, but to be mad like more than an hour, to be mad more than like in the moment, girl, nobody has time to be that mad. It's okay to be mad because you're a human. You have emotions to be like, I'm really upset by this, but don't carry it with you through the day, girl. Let it go. You know, let it go. I'm mad at you because you're mad at me. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, this is the strangest, silliest logic instead of just being like, what's up? Like, or I'm noticing, am mm. I crazy? You know what I mean? Like that, those questions, people rarely do that. Like I'm noticing something, is something up? And if that person doesn't want to say something at the time, cool. But you can then say to them, but as your friend, I just want to point out that you've been a little strange or you're being a little distant, you're being a little weird. Um, yeah, so it's like, it's, it's a two way street. Like in one regard, it's like, yeah, there's certain things as certain friends aren't noticing, but then also it's like, yeah, for whatever reason, you're not comfortable to speak about it. It doesn't always directly mean that person is not a comfortable person to speak with. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is just you and you don't know how to voice these things. Um, but that's the thing. I think you and I were really legitimately getting to almost like the adult phase of our friendship. And neither of us knew what to do with it. Yeah, it was just overall a very, very weird year. And I was really alone and very mm -hmm. okay with being alone. It was like a big thing for for my boy, my ex at the time, like, and I of like socializing like going out and being friends with people. And I did not want to do it at all. Like no parts of me. I was just like, I'm fine. I'm fine in here. <laughs> like, and he thought it was so weird. And so it was like, yeah, maybe that was my, uh, like dealing with our breakup in general. It was like, I almost didn't want to be close with anybody. I was mm. like, I'm cool. I can stay in this house. I have you. I'm perfectly fine. But I'm trying to think really um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that she says to her ex-boyfriend, I don't need to be friends with anyone else. I have you versus my brain says, I don't need anyone else. I have myself. But also like you can't I don't I guess I'm blessed. Obviously, I don't just have one person in my life. Like I have a handful of people in my life. And so it's like different. But it's interesting that mindset of like, I don't need anyone. I have a boyfriend. That's diff very different than how my brain works, but I think it's very relatable to a lot of people's journey. I would want you to know during this time, during that time at least, or even after. I honestly, I still to this day, I had tremendous guilt. Oh. Like very, 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 very guilty because I really knew, um, I felt like I genuinely knew you. I also like really knew your personality type and that like, you know, you just, you didn't really make friends with people like that. And not because it was like, you were just so crazy, you didn't want a friend, but it's like, that was your choice. Like I was your real friend. Like that was mm -hmm. like, this is my friend. And so even all of our little outsider people were just like that, like outsider people. But in reality, it was like, we were like this unit. And so I think in, in breaking up with you, I also knew the weight of that, of like, that like this will be hard on Shannon. There's no doubt in my mind that this is going to be hard on her. So I used to have a lot of a lot of guilt, and um, yeah, overall, which is also what was a part of even when I would see you and maybe not say anything, was it was because I used to think about it for more like myself, and 
liked seeing in, in him. And when he would say um, hi, it would almost piss me off the casualness of it. Cause it was like, huh? Like, you know, this is not casual. This can't be casual. Like I can't see you somewhere and you're just like, hello. Like I actually really appreciated the non speaking to each other at events though. Cause I do agree that like, I wouldn't have benefited from the like, hi. Not at all. Not at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, not for, I mean, I wouldn't, that's the thing is I wouldn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really the reason I'm like, I would have been pissed if somebody was doing that to me. I'd be like, why are you doing this? Why? Like it's too, cause it's too loaded. There's mm -hmm. too much in the friendship, in the scenario. And like the few times that people in my life might've been like, you and Shannon should make up, you and Shannon should be friends. And I would be like, no, like, cause the work of it, Mm. used to feel overwhelming. I remember right. what was weird about that dinner in particular, um, which context wise, the time that we met up before we saw each other at this dinner, that was like this big YouTube thing. Yeah. And I'm with like two of my friends. I'm actually really good friends. Like one of them was like, like Amber is one of my best friends, like mm -hmm. genuine. And I like said, I'm like, oh, that's my ex best friend. And for, for someone who's my really good friend now to have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> and like, that's a really big statement. Like even saying, oh, that's my ex feels like a less like, oh, that's yeah, ex best friend is like, what? But it is it's very weird for somebody who is one of your best friends to think of you have this scenario where that person was your best friend mm. like for them I'm like I wonder what that feels like it's the like. equivalent of saying my ex-husband is here and your friend <laughs> not knowing you were ever married yeah I feel like that's how much of like a big <laughs> yeah 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 there's something about that social situations are hard look let's be real all of humanity is just awkward and the socializing is awkward and the communication style is different and there's just so much assuming and I just don't think people are good at communicating and this is why I say go to therapy meaning go get your brain checked because if you get to a point in your adult life where you feel entitled to your friends in a specific way, I feel like that's something from your childhood. Because like, look, there's gotta be a point in a person's life when like adults mind their business. Like you cannot be breathing down your friend's neck about their life choices. You, you gotta be able to understand how inappropriate that is to some extent. So there's gotta be something there, but also sometimes friendships end and that's good. Look, if things end, it's good if relationships, everything ending is good because it was always going to anyways. Why hold on to something that wasn't yours? If you love it, let it go. It's not wrong for people to move on, but don't tell yourself a narrative about why it happened that is false because you don't want to lie to yourself. And that's the problem. When you tell yourself the wrong story about what happened, it changes reality. And this is what the girls are talking about, which I think is so important to talk about. Tell yourself the wrong story. You're going to harbor resentment and anger for years that is so unnecessary on yourself. Let it go. And maybe personally, my philosophy is like people are all on a journey. And even when they hurt you, like it's just something that they're going through. It is what it is. But like you don't have to ask them to change. You just got to make sure you act accordingly. So I like that they're talking about this because it's personal, you know. <laughs> it just requires so much explanation. Yeah. No, I know that. You know what I also realized, too, is how many people don't know that we know each other? Mm. What's this? What's going I'll on? be honest. Oh. Even once I had sent you that email. Was, wow, they're even showing the emails. Hey, we haven't spoken in a really long time. And a few times I've seen you. I'm not really sure whether to say hi or not. But I just feel like it was time for me to reach out and let you know I don't have any ill feelings towards you. And the next time we see each other, hopefully we can be more comfortable to say hello. Hope you're doing well. Oh, that's nice. That's from Andrea. And then Shannon says, hey, Andrea, this message you sent us to send, wait, sent to us is particularly sensitive for me. On one hand, I'm really glad to hear from you. On the other, because of how my past five years have played out, I haven't gotten the impression at all that you don't have any ill feelings towards me. It's, it's bizarre how much time has passed to request this because I'm not entirely sure where this is to gain from going over what happened, but I know myself and ignoring the gap and just saying hi politely, moving forward is not the right approach for me. If you're interested in setting time aside, aside time to go over lunch or coffee to talk, that would mean a lot to me, but I also respect if this isn't the right approach for you. Okay, love that, love that. Andrea says, I understand that. I'm down to do lunch. Let me know what this coming week looks like for you. Ooh, shit. And then they crossed out sort of like... um the next message, which is just like the, where they were gonna meet and stuff like that. Okay, okay. I was like free. <laughs> I was like, I was like, and I'm done. Like, I felt just like a weight lifted off. And 
I thought that was the best place for me to be in, to be honest, is to have a conversation with you and not have any expectation. Because it's not about that. It's like, it's about like removing all the negative, all the negativity and all the like, the, the things that you. Okay, you know, sorry, I'm going to bring it up again. I'm so sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm watching that realtor show <laughs> selling OC. And one of the things that I will not understand about these people is like, you're on camera. You're literally on camera. So when you talk behind each other's backs and you're gossiping about each other, like we can see you. And that's the stuff I never understood about reality TV, except like a part of it is fake and a part of it's not real. Like, or a part of it is real, like not fake. These are real people. They have real lives. Like this isn't a joke, but also the way some of these women in the office, like talk badly about each other and go behind each other's backs. I'm like, oh my God. And that's what I'm really looking out for is like, are you going to go behind? And like, there's the difference about going behind someone's back and just being consistent with values. And I need you guys to know the difference because to me, there's such a difference. It's like you're friends with a, a conservative who's like religious, they're Muslim and they're anti LGBT. And then when you're not around, you're gay. And when you're not around, they're telling people, oh yeah, I think being gay is totally a sin. And I love my friend, but they're absolutely sinning. And then you're like, oh, how could they say this about me? I'm their friend. Oh, Cause you're gay and they're Muslim. Like I don't understand, right? In my brain, if a person's values say like these actions are bad, then whether you're their friend or not to be consistent with their values, they would also say you are doing a bad thing in my opinion, but you don't have to change because that's just my opinion. Like, is it because I grew up religious? Is it because I grew up with people that like, yeah, you don't change your beliefs for other people. You change your beliefs because it's a real change within your consciousness, like within who you are. So I'm always like shocked, I think, when people make friends with people and expect them to pretend differently than they believe or change who they are to be friends with you. Like, I don't really understand that dynamic expectation. But that seems to be pretty prevalent. But I don't know how these girls are on television being recorded, backstabbing, like stabbing and gossiping. And like, those are the girls you got to watch. Like, those are the people you got to watch, watch out for, boys or girls. It's like people who distort and then twist stories. Because like, what? But like, that's okay. Chat says, not going to lie, real world, ta real world taught me a lot about social dynamics. I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention. Chad always says, well, people do change their beliefs all the time for people they care about, but that's different if you're having a true transformation. But if you're having a fake transformation, then you're just a liar, right? So if you're having a true transformation, like, oh my God, I realized my kid is gay and that's really transforming me as a person, that's unique I and mean, that's good and that's real. But if you're having a fake, like, oh yeah, like it's not what I believe, but I'm not gonna like, talk about it feels weird like it feels like very I don't know controlling I think in some ways to say that my friends have to believe what I believe but also if you're having a real transformation and you're genuinely changing that's beautiful but if you're faking your opinion so we get along or you're faking your opinion so other people it just feels weird it's like how can I trust you like how could I trust you right like I like consistency in people I like people who are consistent regardless you know, thought and the expectations, all that kind of stuff. So now I was, it was more like where one of my close friends was like, okay, well, what are you hoping is going to happen here? And I was like, nothing. <laughs> like, I don't have anything. I was like, the Shannon feels better. Like, you know, that, that, that. Would oh, okay. Hold on. Before we get into it. Uh, Chet says, I'm just careful who I call a friend. I have plenty of acquaintances. I have only two real friends, people who, who I can actually rely on. Okay. No shade to this comment. I actually want to expand on this. I think it's unfair to expect your friends to be reliable outside of their personhood, like more than their personhood can supply. Because there's this illusion that, oh, I expect real friends to act like this and fake friends to act like this. I expect acquaintances to act like this and friends to be this way. I expect people to be who they are regardless of a title. Personally, my personal philosophy is I expect individuals to be who they are regardless of the title. I expect my partner to be who they are regardless of the title, right? Like you have to be yourself. Now, are there actions as yourself you can take because we've negotiated on the expectation? Yes, but I don't expect my partner to be reliable in ways that are outside of their comfort zone. 
because that would be inappropriate. I don't expect my friends to be reliable in ways that are outside of who they are. And I think there's an implication in the world that an acquaintance, acquaintance is somebody you don't rely on, but a friend is somebody you rely on. But I grew up in a community. You can rely on your acquaintance to do so much. I rely on my acquaintances to call 911 if they see my house burning. That's a neighbor, right? That's an acquaintance. I rely on people to stop at red lights. I rely on people to, you know, do a lot of things. And they're not my friends. It's like there is a level of reliability in all of us around us constantly. But I think we've convinced ourselves that friend has a different obligation and and without a negotiation. Like, why aren't you negotiating what your expectations of a friend are instead of assuming what they will be? Right? Like, consider where they are. Uh, Maybe they're not available to you. You know, you could end up taking advantage of people in your life just because you assume you're entitled to them because of a what a t- I bestow upon you a title of my best friend. So now you must give me all of this. That's what it sounds like. Oh, because we're best friends, like now you're entitled to things that I don't, I can't consent to. Like this doesn't make any sense to me. Obviously we should be negotiating. We should say, hey, are you able to do this? Is that, is this available to you? Is this within your capabilities as a friend? And then you can say, actually, it's not, but here's what I can provide. And that's just meeting people where they're at, right? You just meet people where they're at. I think that that for me is something that comes to mind when we start saying like, oh, like this is like, you're my best friend. You should know everything about me and we should pass every quiz on the internet off Quizilla. It's like, no, your best friend doesn't have to know what your favorite color is to be your best friend. They don't even have to understand how you vote. Like your best friend might not know certain things about you. Like she said, like Andrea said earlier, just because you're friends doesn't mean you know anything about my depression. Just because you're my friend doesn't mean you know anything about my finances. Just because you're my friend doesn't mean you know anything about me. What you know about me is what we've actually shared. But there is so much more to a person than what you know about them, right? I think there's a romantic illusion of I know everything about you. You don't even know everything about yourself, How dare you assume you know everything about a person? Would probably be the most versus worrying about like, okay, are they best friends again? Are they back to normal again? Like in reality, it's like, you just want to be cool with this person and be like normal. Mm. Like that's all that you're expecting. Are they back to best friends? Are they back to normal? There's never back to anything. You never go back. You always go forward. You can never go back to being what you were. You can only move forward and come together as you are. The story I told you of having people from my past who we had something before expect to pick something back up with me like years later and for me to accommodate them in LA or accommodate them or when I come home, like make- Ooh, yep, accommodation. In time for them where for me, my home time is really about my family and like the guilt I feel from not being around my niece and nephew, my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. So I- did not want to put that kind of pressure on a friendship that already was. I had this conundrum happen because, you know, I live in Europe now. And when I plan to go home for the States, of course, there's a lot of people who, and I'm so honored, want to maybe see me. And then I have to think about that reality because if I go home to the States, we're not going for very long. And so all of the minimal days that I will be there, let's say there's four days I will be there truly, two days for travel, four days for family. It's not a lot of time to see my family. And my family is all over the States. So who do you make priority time for? And that's why adulting can be very difficult with friendships. It's why maintaining connection is hard because they're not paying your bills. It's not like your friends are paying for your travel. It's not like people can pay. You wouldn't ask your friend to do that. You would, as an adult, plan your trip, plan accordingly, but think about the effort we're making, time off work, financial decisions, emotional labor, All of these things. And yes, people can try to meet you halfway. But what if you have friends in the East Coast and you have friends in the West Coast and you're coming all the way back to America? It's like, who do I go see? Well, I can't see both of you. So what do you do? Do you ask your East Coast friends to come hang out on the West Coast or your West Coast friends to come hang out on the East Coast? Or do you just accept that like we're not going to see each other for a few years? It's a difficult decision to make because you're like, oh, my God. And at the same time, I would hope that people would recognize like this is just the difficulties of being an adult, thank God we have the internet. Thank God we're not back in the day when we had to write letters and hope they would get there. Like at least now we have the internet. 
So it's kind of like, for me, it's about being grateful that at least we have the internet and also acknowledging that, of course, I'm prioritizing a certain trip over another. Like, I'm going to go to the place where I can see the most people in my immediate family than the least amount of people. Like, there are nephews I haven't even gotten the chance to meet yet who I might not be able to see for the next three to four years. And you know what I mean? It's like, there, there are real people's lives. Like, people are, it's difficult. And that's why you have to be grateful for the internet and all the access we have to each other and be grateful for the time you do have together. But that's always a question to ask yourself, like, who do you make time for? Whatever is reasonable. That's kind of my thought process. What is, again, reasonable? What makes the most sense? What is the most within reason? And I think people forget, like, regardless of how you feel, there's something reasonable to do here. And it sucks because you, you do feel bad. Like Shan said, you can feel really bad about it because you're like, I can't go see certain people and that sucks. But hopefully, you know, you make it work. That's why adulting is so difficult. It's why friendships are difficult. And then you wonder why when people get into relationships or even they become single, they isolate into their little bubble because it's like a safe haven. Because if you make being your friend stressful, people aren't gonna wanna be your friend. But at the, the same time, Maybe you need something from your friend that they're not giving you as well. But then that begs the question, what form of intimacy are you demanding of your friends that may be inappropriate or even appropriate? And is it okay to end the friendship? It's always okay to end things. Just make sure you know why you're doing it. Make sure you're not triggered from some childhood abandonment like issue and saying, I can't believe they abandoned me. Did they abandon you? Or did you abandon the relationship? Did they abandon you? Or did they just get a job in a different country? Did they abandon you? Or did they just get drafted to the NFL and they can't hang out? Like, did they abandon you? Or did they just get married? You know, you have to ask yourself. On crutches still of this has to be anything because it doesn't. You know, just because we were very close at one time doesn't mean that we have to continue that or it doesn't mean that we have to don't continue that. It just, it just means that what you gave me then was enough. The friendship that we had at the time was enough. Like all that I experienced with you, like even I, I'm so grateful that you even chose me to do a blog with. Mm -hmm. I was like a nobody kid that had nothing. Like you were this massive celebrity who had like a big following. And so I was so mm -hmm. grateful for what you provided for the friendship, for the laughs, for the good times. Like I get all these video archives. So I felt like you didn't owe me anything. And I feel like we don't owe each other anything. And I think getting to a place of respect and mutuality is just a really nice place to be. Mm -hmm. How does it wrap up? Does it? Doesn't. It doesn't wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> I think of that. Fade to black and we're still talking. <laughs> You know that girl, let's bring it back to Girl Guides. <laughs> you know the song is make new friends, but I'm keep the old. So surprised you know this song. One is silver. And one, one is, is gold. gold. Shit, I know this song. Make it circles new round. friends, but keep the old. It has no end. Old. That's how long I want to be your oh, friend. Oh, Shannon, I'm thoroughly impressed with the fact that you even have that just like to pull out. Did you look at that up? No. Or Wow. Make new friends, I might but keep the old <laughs> one is silver and the other. Why are you singing it like that? <laughs> That's how it's supposed to be sung. <laughs> I finally have a new website that I'm so proud of. Thanks to Squarespace. Okay, so that's the end of that first video that I wanted to watch. So this was from five years ago, right? This was like five years ago. And now there's a new one that was posted in the end of July and it's 10 years. So ex-best friends share their feelings 10 years later. So let's watch that one. Very exciting. Um, Chess says to me, a friend is someone I have a connection that is strong enough to beat the prisoner's dilemma. Like I know they won't snitch on me if we both rob a bank and get caught. Mm. See, that's interesting for me. My rule of thumb with friends is don't do anything that puts me in prison. And if you do anything that sacrifices my liberty and puts me in prison, you're because like, absolutely not. See, that's the difference is I think if you love somebody, you don't put them in a position to send them to prison. And it's not that you don't love them if you do. People are fucked up and journeys are very confusing. But for me, it's like I, you know, I try to be very cautious, though I understand that especially as young people, we've all taken risks that would probably land us in trouble if the right things happened in the right way. 
But ultimately, you know, and I think this is the dilemma is this has to be a conversation that is had, you know, including, and maybe this is just me being, I don't know, the person that I am, but even, you know, when you're smoking weed in a non-legal state, you have to ask people like, hey, are you okay if we get caught? How do you feel about that? Like, do you understand that this is a problem, right? Like, ultimately, don't put me in a position where I could go to prison, but also, if you're gonna do that, at least get my consent first, you know? And so it's kind of difficult, you know? And that's the problem. You know, I remember <laughs> I was traveling with a friend once and we were going international and they were acting really weird. And I was like, why are you acting so weird? And they were so anxious. And I was like, why are you so anxious? And I was like, is it because we're traveling? Like, what's going on? All, you know, what is going on? We finally get to our destination. And they're like, I had weed on me. And I was like, what? And they're like, I had weed gummies. And I was afraid they were going to catch me. And I was like, oh, yeah. I don't know why you would bring weed across international border to a country that is anti-weed. I don't know why you would do that. And then put all of us possibly at risk. Now, did I end this friendship with this person? No. Did I think this person is a bad person? No. I think they just made a very, forgive me for saying this, white woman decision. Okay. They just made a very ignorance is bliss kind of decision. And they, it is what it is. And no, I, I think this person is still a good person. I really like this person. Like, I'm not upset about it. Right. Um, I don't know. I still don't understand why they did it. But hey, everyone makes decisions. And look, ultimately, I think this is very nuanced, right? I don't, and I'm not a fan of prison systems. I believe in restorative justice. I believe in rehabilitation. I believe bad people can be good people. Because ultimately, like, these are situations that shouldn't land you in prison anyways, whether it's like, I mean, I understand that situation, it, it was international, but. Um, did you tell them not to put you in that scenario again? Um, no. I just decided not to travel again with them. I don't tell people to change. I don't tell people what to do. I do not tell people what to do. I change my behavior. I don't ask people to change theirs. I did not ask them anything. I did not make a request of them. I do not make requests of people. I only change my own behavior. And I just never traveled with them again. They're a good person, but you know. Hi, lovers. This is Okay, this is uh, ex-best friends share their feelings 10 years later. So here's the update. Da, 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 da. 